Well, of all the photography books that I've got, I would say that, that my Peter Dombrowskis books would be among my absolute favourites. Um, I first came across Peter's work when I started getting these cards from mates who'd been to Australia. Uh, wonderful, uh, amazingly creative landscape cards, which not only were they better than, than your average postcard, but, but better than most landscape photographers you'll ever see. Um, and in the form of a, of a commercially purchasable product. And that got me intrigued and then I was lucky enough to meet the uh, first winner of the Peter Dombrowskis Memorial Award which was in 1996. This is Cam Crawford who came to stay with us for a few, a couple of weeks and uh, worked as my assistant for that time. And Cam came with all these stories of Peter uh, who his father had been the doctor of and, he, and who had Peter himself had died the year before and I mean Tasmania went into mourning when that happened um, so Cam brought all these stories of Peter and I immediately became engaged by the, the drama and the kind of poignancy of his life um, when Cam left us he, he went back home and he uh, subsequently sent my first Dombrowskis book which was the memorial uh, Dombrowskis book uh, which is just called Dombrowskis. Uh, subsequent to that, I've, I've managed to get hold of Wild Rivers in the Forest um, on the mountain, and recently Liz Dombrowskis sent me Simply. But I think my favourite Dombrowskis book is still this one, uh, the original one, which, which Liz, his widow, uh, published um, about a year after Peter died. Um, and it's it's in, an interesting book in all sorts of ways. One is the production values are fantastic. It comes in this beautiful slipcase, and I think that the whole print run actually was produced like this. It even has a sort of cover for the for the book. Um, and interestingly, unusually for a, a landscape photography book, it has a portrait of the photographer on the front, which is very unusual because most landscape photographers are very shy about having their pictures taken, including me. Uh, and, and so that, I suppose, sets it up very much as a memorial book in that sense. It's a memorial to Peter. It's a stunning production. It's in black, which I suppose is appropriate for a memorial book. And the moment you open it, the black end papers and, uh, and the quality of the paper in, in, internally um, is beautiful. Uh, the design is spare. It's elegant. It's very much Rod Poole, and Rod is the designer who worked with Peter all his life, well, all his uh, working life, uh, and I think their careers are parallel in that sense. So, um, you open the, open the pages and uh, it, it's, in me, it's incredibly austere, really, the design. Uh, classic book design, um, in that sense, it doesn't announce itself, but the design is immediately convincing and you, you feel that it's going to be special and then when the pictures start to arrive after the initial essays um, you know they're just it's classic Dombrowskis this really is supposed to represent his style his ethos his working philosophy uh, and I think that they're arranged I've never really analyzed that very much but I think they're arranged in a kind of um, a geophysical um, progression we start off on the coast and, and gradually move into other types of habitat and environment. Um, the reproduction is stunning, um, although I'm always inclined to think that, that the way Rod organises Pete's repro is they're quite warm. Now whether that's true of the original transparencies or whether it's a, um, a taste thing of Rod's is hard to tell. But even the cooler pictures have quite a lot of red and yellow going on in the background. That's just purely a technical observation. More importantly is the photographs themselves and if we look at them here, um, some of these are actually, or these two, just this second uh, spread in, uh, illustrate a couple of aspects of Pete's work that I I think that, you know, one what he's immediately struck as I suppose most landscape photographers are by phenomena of nature. Uh, and for those of us who live in the UK, um, these sort of sandstone um, streakings uh, are partially familiar from one or two environments that we know, but also wonderfully exotic. Um, 
he does both details uh, at a standoff like this and details quite close up like this example and many of his images uh, have very subtle and quite humorous uh, overtones of the human figure um, the one on the right being a good example of that we see more nature details as we move through and but Pete's not at all frightened of the larger view or the vista and one of the things that really characterizes his work is his use of soft light that's perhaps a well-known aspect um, but it seems to me that his devotion to it is much more to much more than just the fact that, that in Tasmania there's a fair amount of overcast and drizzly conditions um, on the contrary he's he's very very uh, attached and in love with the textures of nature and that means that light should not dominate the images but that the texture and colour breathe out of the pages which so I think the the right hand page here is a really interesting and example of a Dombrovskis um, I think most of us would go out on a day like this and think oh my goodness can't do anything with that the sky is absolutely dull as ditch water uh, and, and almost sort of bleached out um, and, and it won't, you know, if we were going to do anything, we'd do a, we'd do a close-up detail and that would be that. But, but Pete's still able to tackle uh, these kinds of scenes and not be intimidated by the quality of light. Indeed, to actually really use it uh, as, as very much part of the atmosphere. Two great details here. And, uh, and I think, again, as a, a UK-based photographer, I'm struck by both the, 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 the kind of equivalent um, types of environments we have in the UK but also that these are wonderfully specific to Tasmania itself um, the shells on the left particularly there's just so many I, I think every spread in this book I can find something that I can enthuse about so I should probably um, limit myself somewhat but but perhaps as a pattern as we as we see the book um, opening through that that the sky is not the main content here um, it's very much about the texture and feel and tangibility almost of the landscape itself. There's a, there's a, a visceral quality uh, about the way Pete sees and you can reach out and touch uh, the substance and the texture and the feeling uh, of the surfaces, whether it's rock or seaweed or sand or water. Uh, and I think that is, this is a more unusual image of his. And I think it is that, that visceral quality um, that resonates for me and convinces me that this is somebody who was really in love with the land, in love with his landscape. His style is agile, I tend to feel. I mean, he's able to pick up graphic shape like this example um, and render it very beautifully. Uh, he's also very comfortable uh, with the vista, uh, again with this characteristic rather low-key lighting but using that light to bring out the colour and the texture of his subject matter. Well this picture of, of Pete's in particular is one that I know um, and love and, and some, in some ways I hate it because it's so brilliant that uh, it, it sort of ruins every possibility of, of making a picture of kelp or giant kelp as this is um, that will somehow uh, not compete with it but but where you could feel that you could create something equally beautiful even uh, the way that the, it swirls around like this and and then he's even managed to capture the water so that it appears to swirl equivalently uh, in the distance there um, seems to really capture the essence of the energy of, of nature and of the sea um, it's so alive um, this stuff and it's again it's palpable you can reach out and touch it so it's a, a wonderful a wonderful picture and a maddening one as well I've, I've myself looked at, at seaweed umpteen times since and never got anywhere near being as excited about it as I as I am by by this picture of his I notice wonderful light in the background of that as well oh it is and so soft and delicate um, and, and again it's a perfect kind of match for the surfaces of the of the seaweed itself, and I think to to be sensitive to the quality of the light and to know how to use uh, use that light in the best possible way 
uh, is so much part of the journey of being a landscape photographer. Um, and he is certainly a master of that. I mean, inland in, in Tassie, as we are going now, uh, there's, there's lots of rich colour. I, I remember when I first uh, saw Peter's books, it, it made me think, this is an extraordinary place. There's all these amazing textures and colours. And, and one of the things I've discovered subsequently is that actually, you know, in Europe we have this too. It's just that he really drew my attention to it for the first time. And I suppose I would regard him as a big influence on me. Um, and, I, and I hope so. Perhaps, though, it's... Uh, I mean, just to, talking in general terms, philosophically, um, it's probably to begin with, it was the quality of light that really inspired me because I, I realised that yes, you can make wonderful photographs in conditions that don't appear to be very helpful. Uh, and it's, I know it's a, a great source of amusement for, for landscape photographers that when when people who are not photographers talk about the weather being great, it invariably means there's no clouds in the sky. Whereas for, especially for a large format landscape photographer, actually the last thing you want is a blue sky with, with no clouds in it. Pete's pictures are almost invariably shot with uh, in, in very subdued lighting. This is an interesting one here on the left, not one I've really paid a great deal of attention to, but if we look carefully, we can see there is sunlight in the gorge in the distance. And, Knowing light as I do, I can be pretty clear that that was made on a day when the sunlight was uh, was softened and moderated by high cloud, um, and and just by reading the little clues in this picture, I'm able to extrapolate out uh, to understand the feeling of the day, and I'm really struck by the fact that on this day he found himself in this gorge, um, the Douglas Gorge, and. Uh, and, and made this image using predominantly shadow tones. So areas that most of the picture is, is uh, lit, um, not by sun, but by the cloud. And where there is sunlight, it's very, very low in contrast, just enough to lift the mood of it. Uh, very subtly and beautifully seen, very well judged and balanced. There's, I know that Pete was try and tilt that a little bit. Yeah, himself okay. a, a, a big uh, student of the history of landscape photography uh, and he, he cites Elliot Porter as one of his main influences and Ansel Adams and uh, as you would expect but of course Ansel's work is predominantly uh, monochrome and, and Pete's work is so very distinctively in colour and about the colour of nature, that it's an integral element in his work. As time's gone by and I've seen more and more of his work, it seems to me that there's a very, very individual, consistent quality, uh, which I think is perhaps more true of him than any other photographer I know, and that is that his work reflects the, the spirit of somebody who put landscape first above his work, if you like. He was more interested in making a statement about landscape, uh, about being outdoors, than about himself. Uh, now, that's an interesting thing to say because clearly when we look at these pictures, we, we must be engaged by the fact that here's somebody who went out in all weathers, in all conditions, walked miles and miles and miles to get to very obscure locations, carrying, so I'm reliably told, 80 pounds on his back, typically. Um, in order that he could camp on his own with enough food to keep him going for three or four days at a time and then come back. So it was a serious, serious endeavour um, physically a, as a commitment. And yet, when you look at the images, it seems that although you could argue, uh, of course, behind the camera is the man, these are very much about the subject matter. The subject matter is key, it's king, it's the, it's, it's the heart of the image making. And there's something quite modest about that. There's something humble about it. Uh, and the spirit of that humility really resonates for me. It really, it really means something. I, I really admire and respect that, that quality. It's something I would love to emulate, but I know that I don't succeed. Um, but for me, that's perhaps why, of all colour photographers, uh, this, this body of work is the one that... Uh, I appreciate the most. And this particular book is just such an 
extraordinary diverse as, as I keep turning the pages we're seeing more and more different habitats um, and so this is both a, a celebration of the man but perhaps more than that it's a celebration of the Tasmanian landscape in the mountains here this is unusual I think this is it this one one of these pictures actually maybe it's not that one but there's it there is one or two long lens pictures uh, in here and I know one of them has his tent in the distance there it is uh, actually, that, that thing of, about um, uh, him carrying so much kit in, uh, the tent, we, we were just saying, the tent is, is a big tent uh, for one person uh, and no doubt uh, enabled him to, uh, to cook inside it and to live inside it comfortably when, when things got difficult and presumably keeping all his equipment dry. Uh, Pete used a Linhoff Technica, Master Technica 5x4, there's actually a picture of him here, which I'll just put in front of the camera a second, um, which is a camera familiar to many. Not one chosen by landscape photographers mostly nowadays because uh, quite limited lens possibilities for it. 90 is really about the widest that you can practically use on it. And I know that he typically carried, I believe he all through his career carried three lenses, a 90mm wide angle, a 150 standard lens, and a 300 millimeter nickel M, uh, which is a long focus lens, uh, which this picture would have been shot with. Uh, basically, pretty lightweight kit, um, but by the time you've accumulated all the survival gear necessary to be out in the wilderness, um, it was a, it was a big pack, uh, and most of his pack, I'm guessing, would have actually contained stuff other than camera camera equipment. It's also interesting for us in the UK where we don't really have wilderness apart from one or two areas of Scotland that you could possibly describe that way, uh, that still vast tracts of Tasmania are true wilderness. They haven't been influenced by human beings and of course that's part of the charm and the charisma of these landscapes um, for anybody who is sensitive to landscape to look at. We'll look across these mountain ranges and in environments that are untouched, there's no pathways, there's no grazing going on other than by wild animals and it just has that primeval beauty about it still. Do you think it must have fundamentally changed his view of his environment, having camping in it regularly and living living inside it rather than visiting it? Mm, yes, I think so. Um, in, in actual fact, I, I had a conversation with Colin Pryor a couple of weeks ago and he was saying that you never really know a landscape until you've slept in it. And uh, it, I think Colin actually probably said know a mountain, which he would say, but it's, uh, it, it's the same, essentially the same idea. I think, I think to sleep out in the open, or at least in a tent in the open, um, connects you in a different way. You have to become attuned and connected to the rhythms and the, uh, the absolute dominating forces of being outside, which is obviously the weather, uh, the habitat, uh, understanding water courses and knowing how to avoid getting flooded out at night, um, ensuring that your you know your toilet activities are compatible um, with the landscape, um, and all of that sort of thing. Um, it, you're also dependent on water supply. Uh, you wouldn't be able to. Pete certainly wouldn't have carried any significant amount of water in with him, so he would have to. Uh, I've dealt with that. Did he purify? Did he boil? Did he just drink straight from streams? Um, that I don't know, but he would have, as an experienced outdoorsman, have understood what was safe uh, and what would keep him alive. Um, his focus, though, uh, far be it, uh, you know, to be preoccupied with survival, seems completely on, um, on, on the content of the landscape itself and to bring it back and share it with us. Um, in his own very particular way. Although I've said that I feel the subject is the thing, it's notable that he uses many of the classic devices uh, that landscape photographers have used for a hundred years and continue to, uh, to draw our attention um, to the beauty of, uh, of the place and the atmosphere of it. Um, just going back to that last one, the kind of three-pillared design um, almost makes me think of the, the three graces of um, Italian sculpture uh, and indeed Greek sculpture before that. Um, 
the, the essential elements of uh, the the artistic elements of graphic design and so on uh, are self-evident in, in his work um, and the other thing that I'm constantly struck by in his close-up work this is a very good example is is the kind of anthropomorphisms uh, when he, when he sees a tree like this he can't help also feeling that there's a there's a kind of human force um, breaking out of it there's almost a tummy button here isn't there you know in the arms uh, and, and he relates very physically uh, to the textures and gesture of nature gesture to use John Blakemore's term if we again look at this detail here uh, I see more do you see flames do you see human figures do you see pure energy uh, you can interpret these forms of course in your own way but I think I think there's a there's a humanity uh, about the way that Pete organizes his compositions that on some level or another consciously or otherwise I think many of us will relate to Pictures like this, I think, are very unusual. This is so distinctively Dombrovskis. Uh, I don't know whether this conforms with any landscape composition convention. I tend to feel it probably doesn't. Um, and yet, the precision of the composition uh, and the forms and forces that occupy this space work because they're balanced. And all of his best pictures have that quality of balance about them. Can I pause for a second? Just sure. to move that across a little bit mm. and see if we can use that to... No, it's not big enough, is it? Mm -hmm. See, that's okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, do you want to go back to that one and just talk about the balance and mm. composition, the fact that some, sometimes they, there aren't compositional rules that can work and, and where balance is, is, is inherent, you know. You, you yes, I'll try and see, yes. I think the, this particular example is such a, a good example of, of a Dombrovskis because there are, um, Pete has his own rules, I think, of, of composition. Um, that in a way, it, this is completely wrong. You know, this branch sticking out of the, the left-hand side uh, of the picture with this rather striking reflection uh, and and there's there's no apparent resolution of content here uh, the conventions are defied and yet actually when you analyze it in terms of composition purely as shape and line and balance you see these curves here occupying the corners clearly frame the composition and the left hand uh, sorry in the lower parts of the composition, the, these corners are much more subdued, but they're certainly not distracting. Um, this stone with its strong sort of implications of a face here, drawing energy this way helped to, to balance this strong, more abstract uh, linear element uh, on the left. This, the, the reflection of the, uh, of the, of the sky, uh, bright here without much detail, um, but it's all contained, so the energy of that bright area is contained within the composition. So in spite of the fact that on the face of it there's a lot you could describe as kind of wrong composition with it, in the end it adds up. It adds up in a very distinctive way, it's a very confident piece of work I think. I, I imagine Peter would have made a lot of instinctive decisions that, that added up to something that he could probably describe afterwards as why possibly why you made the decisions like you have. Absolutely. Well, I, to be honest, I think when you look at your own work, it's sometimes very hard to say why you've done things it's as exactly as you say. Um, it, it's an instinctive response uh, and you work the camera and things feel right. And that's where you resolve the composition and, and load the film and shoot it. Uh, other people, you know, in, um, you know, in hindsight and in cool reflection and looking at it in a book can, can talk about the design at the time. So much of it, I think, just comes from the heart. Mm. But I think that when you do something as unconventional as that, you have to have a lot of confidence uh, to be able uh, that, that what you have to say about landscape is worth saying. And clearly, when you, you select a subject like that, it's not because you think it's a, a nice, easy thing to shoot. It's because you love the combination of elements, in this case perhaps some of the colours that are going on here, the, the various textures and tones that can be found. So this, this would probably be more a, a combination of an instinctive love of what he's seen and then applying some of his own balancing 
um, yes. any rules, for instance, yes. the top corners, yes. trying to make sure that they resolve. And, uh, and that, but the rest of it might be an instinctive, well, it, well, it, it works. So it's, yes. it's, it's balancing this together. Work, this works for me. Mm. Um, an interesting aside, uh, looking at something like this, and I think large format photographers will relate to this, is that Pete only ever shot one exposure of everything he did, which is a remarkable thing to know, uh, because again, as we all know, when you use with a large format camera and uh, you have no histogram to refer to, only your light meter and your experience, it adds up to uh, a high risk, high stakes operation um, to get it on, on one sheet. Uh, he didn't use quick load, like many of us now, he used double dark slides, and that's why he only took one picture, because you try carrying double dark slides out into the wilderness. With everything you know, else. Yeah, and I don't know if he took a light tent, I doubt it. I think he actually probably had 20 preloaded holders, and that would have been a big part of the weight that he was carrying, uh, and try and decide what am I going to commit myself to with perhaps 40 sheets of film for four days photography. Um, it's a discipline, it's a form of, it's almost a form of meditation, judgments that you have to make in the field that are absolutely critical. Not only do you have to judge the composition, but to say, right, I've got one sheet, I've got to judge this tonally and exposure-wise and make sure that it works. Uh, and of course, sometimes he failed, I know that, because I've, his, his widow Liz has uh, talked to me about him, you know, the disappointments that, that came with it, but mostly he got it right, and that's because he had developed a, a, sure, compos a sure technique uh, and an exposure uh, regime and approach that worked for him. I'll turn a few, couple more pages and see what we can find here. Well, there's a the deciduous birch, I think it is here, deciduous beech rather. Uh, this is a favourite subject of Pete's, the, the woods, the forest. He's done a book called In the Forest, which I have somewhere here. And these textures and colours are so uh, such a characteristic feature of his work. I'll just put that one there for now. There's perhaps ones that are more famous. Um, but just worth uh, looking again at, at, uh, at the sort of decisions that Dombrovskis makes in the field uh, and the sort of characteristics that we see in his work. One of those is that when we see the sky, very often it's burnt out. He doesn't worry about that. He's able to to feel uh, rightly, in my view, um, that these kinds of technical imperfections, um, as we might regard them, uh, are, are simply a byproduct of, of of looking at trees and the fact that you have sky beyond. Whether he had any sort of special approach um, that enabled him to hold tone, uh, these still appear to have a little bit of tone in the in the whites, um, or lenses that were his lenses may have been perhaps a bit older and lower contrast than the ones we use today, um, so that it, it, it made it more manageable, I'm, I'm not absolutely sure. My guess is it's down to the light, uh, and he knew what kind of lighting conditions he could get away with um, shooting uh, into bright skies. I think we can see anyway that the white elements in this composition do not detract. In fact, in some ways you could say they enhance the graphic elements. Um, yeah, I think if, if I have one problem with, uh, with, with with quite a lot of Pete's work is that, not that there's a problem with it, but that he makes it look easy uh, because everything seems natural. It seems just right. And, you know, as a, as a working landscape photographer, I know that it's not easy to do this, uh, to find these elements and to resolve these small details, that these overlaps, the juxtapositions, the, the rhythms and the harmonies and can I get it all in focus or do I need to get it all in focus and what about the bright highlights and, um, and actually in the end does the feeling of rhythm and flow and structure and colour and luminosity all communicate what I'm trying to say and that's, that's the art really. This, this is more like the, there is a hidden photographer inside there because as you say when you first look at it it does look as if it is a, a straight on view of a, mm. of a piece of forest you've seen. But when you look deeper into it, you start seeing these uh, conscious choices mm. of balance and conscious choices mm. of where, where he's placed the curved branches either side of the corners. Yes. Um, yes. And the yes. rhythm of the trees going through the picture. If you resolve something so perfectly as he has done is there, especially in such a wild habitat, there's a temptation to think it is easy. 
Um, but because it, it's just right. Well, why wouldn't it look like that? But you know, you don't have to step left or right a couple of feet, and the whole thing will fall apart. Of roots uh, of a uh, of a large buttress tree. I forget which type of tree it is. Whether it's in the Everglades or something like that. It, what one of these sort of um, very damp environment, um, tropo subtropical um, forest kind of environments. And uh, the, the graphic design elements of that, of that tree are remarkable. Beautiful, beautiful picture. I'm quite sure Pete knew that picture and uh, that, that he may well have been inspired looking at, at these images by, um, by what he'd seen of Ansel's. But it's, this is very much his work and his way of interpreting these themes is, of course, solely his. I absolutely love this image here. I think the if we half close our eyes, if we squint at this view, uh, you can see the structure of the main theme, of the tree trunk. It's almost centered, not quite centered. Um, the, the way the light flows out, it's almost like liquid light uh, in this image. Uh, the way that the, the single uh, branches of either vines or um, much more uh, much younger trees dance around the main theme has a very strong musical uh, analogy this for me um, the fluency of it uh, and and everything about it it's as if there's there's this strong melody and then it has a kind of riff running through it here in the form of the uh, of the vine uh, on the main trunk and the tones and colors well this it will be partly down to, re to the repro seem to work perfectly for this image too. There's, there's quite a green tint to it, but that seems absolutely right uh, for this subject. But his way of, of communicating light, uh, composition, the texture uh, of the place uh, are, are wholly his, I feel. This image on the left a rather more of a cameo, um, typical piece again, but perhaps also inspired by Ansel Adams. I, I think of Ansel's picture of the dead tree stump with the grasses growing up through it, clearly an image of, you know, of the circle of life, uh, and and here we have uh, uh, this old elderly um, statesman tree with a tiny um, sapling budding up through this embracing shape uh, in in the foreground. It's a lovely, I, I presume, conscious placement of a um, a leaf in the bottom right hand corner, yeah. and then and then the background is is resolved as a picture on itself. Exactly, a picture within a picture, which is, as you know, one of my favourite uh, sort of Indeed. topics. Yeah, because it's it, it's what makes landscape images rich and resonant and continue to to fascinate. I think uh, over time, it's not that they should resolve themselves in a single instant and uh, never need any further investigation or explanation. But in fact, there is more to it than meets the eye when you first. Uh, glance at something. This picture has uh, that uh, very much as well, and of course it's uh, it's used large on the page. It's clearly meant to, um, uh, you know, to be seen in that way. But it has an immediate strength and power. But there's an awful lot more going on there. So this is maybe uh, one that was inspired, I think, by Elliot Porter, who. Uh, who is a real pioneer of colour photography, and I know that, uh, that that Pete cites him in among his influences. I may have said that already, but uh, the 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 technique of seeing the colours of a canyon reflected uh, in the shallows, uh, um, something that Elliot did uh, on more than one occasion, and we see reproduced in his books, is one that you can one can find elsewhere. Perhaps it needs somebody to to show you that's possible, and I don't think Pete was. Um, uh, you know, oblivious to that. We see what's going on here. Um, the mountain, Cradle Mountain itself, I, I believe, is being lit by early morning winter sunlight. But of course it's not in the composition. It is, however, reflected in the ice here. And there's a fantastic combination of golden tones uh, and this green-blue uh, in the shadows, because probably the sky is fairly blue. and it's that combination of, uh, of reflected light and ambient light working together that give this picture its depth uh, and, and its notes and, uh, uh, and, and the main theme really. But in addition to that, it has numerous little compositional details that satisfy us and that draw us around the whole space 
of the frame. Beautiful sh frost on uh, the grasses at the back, on these uh, rather more low crop grasses at the front. And combined with all sorts of subtle variations around uh, the colour on ice theme that forms uh, the, the main, the, perhaps the main theme of the composition. My one beef with this is that I'm not sure it, it works perfectly having it bled to the edge of the, the book format sadly. But uh, yeah, overall a really, really, another really striking composition. Actually I'd just like to finish by reading a very, very short passage from Patricia Sabine's introduction to his uh, most recent book, Peter's most recent book, um, which I think sums it up really well. Peter's photographs take you into the place where he has been, across and through the barrier of the frame and into the heart of the image. Together with Peter you slip down into a silent valley, sense the light sting of windblown sand and smell the ozone tang of the great fields of stranded kelp. You instinctively understand the need to slow down the need to wait, alert for the moment of luminescence in which you open the shutter. And I think that quite well uh, distills the essence of what Dombrovskis is about for landscape photographers, both photography and landscape partners in a, a great endeavour to communicate love for nature and joy for life. And uh, while I'm very, very sad, I never met Peter, uh, I feel very uh, blessed to be able to look at his work, uh, to be able to continue to enjoy his legacy. Uh, for those of you who don't know, he died in 1996 at the age of 52, far too young, I would argue. Uh, given uh, what he'd achieved, one feels there was still a great more to achieve. Um, but his image of the Rock Island Bend of the Franklin River Gorge, the frontispiece of Simply Dombrovskis here, uh, is widely attributed as the, uh, the key element that forced politicians to engage with public opinion and to put an end to the damming of the Franklin River. Uh, Lake Pedder had already been um, artificially dammed um, when this new scheme was introduced. So Peter knew all about the, um, the dangers of allowing development to uh, continue unchecked in Tasmania. So he was a real hero for the environmental movement as well as to us photographers um, and fortunately for us his legacy lives on in these books today and I would thoroughly recommend them to anybody who loves books of landscape photography.